Hey, well, let's get started. So it's a real honor to introduce Justin Noble here. Um, he hails originally from New Orleans, I believe. Is that right? Lived there for a while. Lived in New Orleans for a while. <laughs> Currently in up upstate New York and has written widely for so many different um, investigative journalism outlets like the Smog Blog, mainstream outlets like Newsweek, Time Magazine. His work has been covered in places like the New York Times, and he's written books. One uh, that struck me was Standing Still in a Concrete Jungle. It, it exemplifies how creativity can really be just very simple, where he just stood in places in New York City for 14 hours straight to observe <laughs> what was around him in a bunch of different places in New York City. Or the project that he co-launched uh, called January the 20th Project, which was the Obama inauguration. And what he did there was to, to try to get unconventional views of that inauguration everywhere from Kenya to Iraq to places in Washington, D.C. where people couldn't actually see. You know, they weren't led into the inauguration, but they were still, you know, in D.C. at the time. So it's a really creative stuff. He's going to be talking about uh, and building on his work in Rolling Stone. He broke a major story expose, I think it was January 21st of this year, and that work is being um, part of a book that he is currently writing and continuing to do research on. So it's a really good time for him to meet with a lot of the people. And I know he wants to hear about what's happening in Weymouth, for example, and the connections that he may draw there. So he's going to talk for about 30, 35 minutes, and then we'll just open it up from there. Uh, the last thing I want to note is that he has uh, produced this, uh, what he calls a radio, it's titled Radioactive Cookbook. And it's a, uh, I think it's a resource for people like us who are really wanting to know more about what's going on, whether it's in the fracking fields or in the downstream areas of oil and gas. And he's got a bunch of copies, and he's willing to give them away free, but he's also open to uh, donations for this. So um, you'll, you'll be able to get a copy of one of these in a bit. So with that, welcome, Justin. Thank you, Dr. Phillips. Nathan, really wonderful introduction. I love that you focused on um, some of the more creative elements of the work that I've done. Mm -hmm. um, and I know for people, if you're involved in an environmental fight, it seems like difficult to get back to the creative side and you're so focused on this, but I think it's actually so important to, to come at all these issues with um, a creative mentality with a, with a you know, thoughtfulness that goes outside the box. Um, and it's really that tendency to want to pay attention to minutia um, that led me into this topic. Um, so I'll just I'll explain the research question that arose. Um, and this right here, this is the cover of uh, the Rolling Stone story. Uh, and this was a 20-month investigation, which is really long for a magazine story. Um, and the question was, let's examine the radioactivity that comes to the surface in oil and gas production and the many different pathways of contamination posed to the industry's workers, the public and communities, and the environment. Um, the process was first to look at the research that exists on this topic. There actually is a fair bit of research. Um, connect with the authors, the scientific report authors, follow advice that they give, um, follow the interesting citations in the articles that I could find, uh, and then just go from there on down the rabbit hole. Um, and I want to thank a group that I always thank, um, which is the people on the ground who are fighting a lot of these projects. None of this work that I do could be possible without this group. Um, you all are out there in places where things are happening, collecting information and gathering information, whether it's with your eyes, with your phones, recording, observing, um, and, and also recording you know, some of the physical traumas of, um, of going up against this industry. And that is just so essential. Um, and I think it's so important to mention, because I know 
a lot of journalists will say that I do not talk to the activists, um, and I have such a problem with that. And I see these are not activists, these are people in their communities who have the courage to care and the courage to pay attention. Uh, and their voices are essential and their information is essential. And if you ignore that, um, mm -hmm. you're going to have a hard time, you know, putting the pieces together. So this story is really possible by following the science, by talking to researchers, but also being in touch with organizations across the country that are fighting back in all sorts of different ways. Um, and so just going to um, one of the researchers, one of the really um, excellent uh, scientist and someone who's located not so far away at Worcester Polytechnic Institute, but um, Dr. Marco Kaltafen, this is his quote, he's a nuclear forensic scientist, so I think kind of like Sherlock Holmes, um, but for radioactivity, and he laid the whole issue out in such powerful and crisp, simple terms. Essentially, what you are doing is taking an underground radioactive reservoir and bringing it up to the biosphere where it can interact with people and the environment. We never think of oil and gas development in this way, but this is a version of what's happening as well. Um, and when it's clarified by an expert, everything else kind of crystallizes into place. This is also happening at an oil and gas wellhead. We are bringing um, radioactivity up to the surface and somehow it has gone 150 years of oil and gas development without being thoroughly examined. Um, but we're changing that. So um, again, it hasn't been examined. There also hasn't been a textbook created about it. So I have to come up with my own very simple diagrams um, to lay out some of these issues. But this is just a diagram um, that actually is conveying quite a lot. It's showing the different types of oil and gas development that happens. And then it's listing the different waste streams that come to the surface that can have a high radioactive signature. Um, and I think the first thing to digest, uh, to understand, is that oil and gas production actually brings a lot of waste to the surface. Um, again, this was my, um, my bias or my um, image before coming into this was that, you know, you've got oil and gas coming up, some sort of infrastructure at the wellheads, you've got pipelines, refineries, eventually fuel for your car or home. But there's an extraordinary amount of waste that comes to the surface at an oil and gas wellhead. Inevitably, it has to come to the surface. It's down there in the formation. One of the primary waste streams is this toxic, salty liquid that the industry calls brine or produced water. Um, and this comes in abundance at an oil and gas wellhead, uh, often about 10 times as much brine as oil. So this is a really significant waste stream in Louisiana. Um, I know we have some people from Louisiana in here. Uh, we used to live in Louisiana. So a common way to deal with oil and gas in Louisiana, to deal with the brine at an oil and gas wellhead, was just to put it off into the bayou, to kind of run it off um, into the bayou. Brine not only has a high salt content, it has toxic heavy metals, things like arsenic and lead. It has known carcinogens, um, volatile organics, so things like benzene. And it also has radium. Uh, in Louisiana, radium started showing up in oysters. Um, so I'll get to what we do with Brian in a second, um, but just for a moment to focus on, you know, why is radium in brine? Radium is a radioactive element. It's peppered throughout the Earth's surface, and brine has a high salt content, and that high salt content actually enables radium to be freed from the ro rock formation and flow with brine. So it's this interesting geochemical property of brine that actually enables it to have a very high radium content. Um, and so in a conventional well, um, we're going to have brine. And this is um, one of the revelations is that the radioactivity problem is not just a fracking problem. It's also a problem in conventional wells. But in an unconventional layer, such as the Marcellus, which is being fracked right now in Pennsylvania, there's the potential for radioactivity levels um, to be even higher. Um, and since we're in a school or in a science setting, I'll just get right into like a really, it's not that difficult and it's a really important scientific part of this. Why is the Marcellus higher? And maybe a lot of people have heard Marcellus has a higher radioactivity concentration that becomes very important in downstream things like pipelines and compressor stations. So that's because the Marcellus is a black shale. Black shales are the mother load for oil and gas uh, in this, you know, Earth that we live in. So if you imagine a shallow marine environment such as the Gulf of Mexico right now, you have a lot of dead organic material falling to the bottom of the sea and it's accumulating at the bottom. Things like dead marine algae 
and you're accumulating this <laughs> organic rich layer at the bottom. Eventually that will be um, overtopped by other things, compacted. That is your future oil and gas that you're forming there. Um, in geology, it's called a black shale layer, but also at the bottom of a shallow sea, in the same place we're accumulating the organic matter that will form your future oil and gas layer, you're accumulating uranium-238 and thorium-232. These are two long-lived radioactive elements, and over time they're going to decay on into other things. And so this is why a black shale has a particularly extraordinary levels. Um, and I'm just going to cut to a slide that just shows this um, with some of our industry's own science. So what is so wild about a lot of this is we, uh, we knew about this a long time ago. So this is a report done by the US Geological Survey, still great scientists there. Um, even through this administration, they've been uh, receptive with a lot of my questions. Um, but note who the report is done for, US Atomic Energy Commission. So early on, you know, right now we're digging into black shales looking for oil. This study actually assessed the uranium content of black shales. Um, and some quotes from that study, a fairly positive relationship exists between oil yield and uranium content. So again, where you find, where you have high concentrations of radioactivity, you're inherently often going to have higher organic content um, and vice versa. And the oil industry used this property of the Marcellus to actually look, and they still use it, to look for hot spots, sweet spots of high um, yield in the Marcellus. Um, and um, right, at that point they considered oil the byproduct. The amount of uranium in these shales is extremely large. So uh, again, this is something our geologists knew about. And you know, people work in silos. They had this knowledge. They were thinking along very different lines. Um, unfortunately, the knowledge you know, hasn't passed through um, the different pathways of society. So just going to jump back there to Brian. Um, so how much radium is in brine? You know, what are the levels? And these are just some of the limits laid out. Um, we do know a bit about radium. Radium is a really worrisome radioactive element. Um, radium has the ability to flow with water. It's soluble. So this is why radium, not all the radioactive elements that are down in uh, an oil and gas layer will have a tendency to flow to the surface. Uranium, for example, much less water soluble, but radium um, will have this tendency to flow. So um, we know about radium. EPA is so concerned about it, they've set a limit in drinking water at five picocuries per liter. Um, and you can just focus on the number five. We're so worried about it, we're gonna set the limit at five. Nuclear Regulatory Commission has a discharge limit, two different isotopes of radium, 226, radium 228. Both of those isotopes, the discharge limit for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is 60, so you add those together because the isotopes are often counted together. We're at 120, so we have 5, 120. This is new to me in correspondence with the EPA. They actually define liquid waste uh, being above 60 picocuries per liter for either radium-226 or radium-228. They define that as radioactive. So just remember these numbers, 5, 120, 60, and now we're going to go to a list of the radium levels in brine formations across the country. Um, and these are the highest recorded readings. Um, and the reason I couldn't do average is because there's so little data, it's difficult to determine what an average would be. But highest, you know, this exists. So yeah, if you start at the top, Gulf Coast, these are wells that we've been, um, you know, we've been accessing oil and gas from the Gulf Coast for 100 years. Even there, the brine is high above any, any of our limits, 3,087 picocuries per liter. And again, you're going to be producing 10 barrels of brine to every barrel of oil. That's a lot of radioactive stuff you have to deal with. And then you go on down. Some formations, not as much. The denver Julesburg, a big play in the suburbs of Colorado right now, an oil and gas play. Levels are much lower, but still higher than any of those numbers. And then Marcellus at the way bottom. Uh, and this data is from a report of the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection, and this is really extraordinary, 28,500 picocuries per liter, and the average is around 9,000, according to that report done by the Pennsylvania, uh, Pennsylvania State DEP. Um, so this matters for a lot of reasons. Right now, we don't just you know put brine off into a stream or into a waterway. Um, the way we deal with it is by taking it to an injection well. So um, we've moved past that step, we now have this um, method, which is you put into a truck, 
the truck drives often through a small community uh, on rural roads, if, especially if you're in Pennsylvania or West Virginia, and you go to a site called an injection well where we inject the brine back into the earth. Um, now, in some form, maybe this is the best thing to do with it. The idea is, you know, we're going to put it back where it came from. But injection wells have very little appropriate regulation. They're causing mm -hmm. earthquakes. No one is monitoring the brine underground. And it's not necessarily the exact same place where you took it from. It's a different formation, typically. Uh, and we have very little idea how the brine is moving once it's down there. Furthermore, when brine comes back up, it, it may also be mixed with fracking chemicals and other sorts of things. Um, these trucks, um, but let's just focus on the trucks, right? So this, this is, and I'll get to why it's not regulated in just a moment, but this is the situation we have. This truck, um, it has this sign residual, so it might actually be holding some sort of residual waste, which means like a sludge, which levels could be even worse in a sludge because things have accumulated. But here back, if you can read that, that says brine. So, okay, maybe it's brine. There's no hazmat placard, there's no labeling. And this is downtown Barnesville, Ohio. Beautiful little town in Eastern Ohio, surrounded by oil and gas development. That's their main intersection. And you have this truck passing, a complete mystery truck. If you're a first mm -hmm. responder, you have no idea what's in that truck. It could have brine at these extraordinary levels. Um, it could not, it could have the mostly sludge and a little bit of brine. There's just no sign. Um, and these trucks, I've sat at the corner in this town, and they'll have a brine truck that passes maybe every once every five minutes. Um, it's continual. Again, if you're, if you're drilling for oil and gas, you're producing brine. And even if you stop drilling, a well is now producing, it, it will be producing brine just as it will be producing product. But you cannot turn off the brine valve. You have to do something with it. So we put it in trucks, we take it to injection wells. Many of the injection wells are in Ohio. Um, and so trucks will be coming from Pennsylvania and West Virginia. They crash all the time. Uh, in Barnesville, they actually had the brine truck crash right beside the reservoir. And brine went across the farmer's field into the reservoir. Um, this on the left, and this, all of this, you know, it just points to the, the regulatory abyss. This is a injection well that is in a shopping mall. Um, and I met in a shopping mall, yeah. And this is the view, if you had to zoom the camera, um, I met a driver. A lot of drivers have been coming out since the story, the Rolling Stone story, um, was published to express really horrific tales of contamination. But I met with a driver recently. We met at a Taco Bell, which was in that shopping mall, and we could look out and see trucks unloading brine, you know, while we're sitting in a Taco Bell. Right next to that is a Verizon store. Um, so how do you get to this point where you have radioactive waste being injected into the ground by a driver who's unaware? These drivers are typically told that they're hauling water or salt water. Um, yeah, yeah, there's a burning question. Yeah, oh, can I? yeah. And just for reference, like how, how does the radioactivity levels of these compare to, for example, nuclear waste from like a nuclear power plant or something? Yeah, well, it's a good question. So nuclear power plant, I mean, the, that discharge limit would apply to a power plant. So they're not allowed to discharge into the environment at levels that are above 60 picocuries per liter for rating 226, 60 picocuries per liter for rating 228. And yet these trucks are carrying brine that could be at levels of well above 20,000. Um, so they are, you know, that is one way to look at it. In terms of like worker exposure, um, and this quote came out again and again in the story, oil field workers should be treated as radiation workers. Um, and um, since you asked that, I'll jump to the slide and then get back to the exemption. So, you know, where would the worker be at risk? Driving the truck, you know, wouldn't necessarily be the biggest risk. The risk is when they're pulling up and they have to hook up the truck to the brine tank. Often brine's gonna be getting on their hands and no radiation expert will tell you, you know, that one exposure is gonna give you cancer. But that's not a good exposure. It's gonna be getting on your clothes. And if you have that every day, that's something um, to consider. And also these drivers aren't informed. So the lack of knowledge leads to situation. Drivers have told me, you know, they're hooking up the truck and they'll be eating lunch while they're hooking up the truck. And this is worrisome because you're, you're then bringing, you have the potential to bring radium into your body. It's a bone seeker. Um, but the, wor the most worrisome job, um, we'll just jump to this, is the job of cleaning out the tanks. So drivers do a lot more than haul brine. <laughs> 
Yeah, here we go. So they, they actually have to get inside the tank. There's a little hole in the back of the truck called a clamshell. Um, and they go inside, they clean out those tanks, and they also clean out the brine tanks themselves. So the same tanks you saw by the Taco Bell. And so, you know, this is a devastating exposure. And here you are dealing with material that would be on this level of, you know, low level nuclear waste because you've accumulated sludge in the bottom of the tank. So whereas brine has a signature that can be worrisome, the accum uh, when you're in a, a type of vessel where things have the ability to accumulate, um, the levels can be much higher. And so, um, and I don't have, we don't have readings necessarily from brine tanks. We have readings from other places of what these sludges are um, and, they're, and they're worrisome. But the job, you know, this is the, in the industry they call this PPE, personal protective equipment. And it's basically nothing. Uh, and often these clothes will be washed in someone's family washing machine yeah. with their kids' clothes. Um, so this is the devastating risk that these workers are facing. I'll just read this quote at the bottom because I asked the worker who passed this photo to me, I, like, how could you even be inside a tank and not, you know, run fleeing from even the first moment? And you have this industry where, you know, to tough it out is part of the um, kind of bravado nature of the industry. And they said, guys would actually have competitions. Like, who could stay there in the longer? You want to tough it out if you complain to your boss. They'll say, shut up, you know, go home if you don't like it. You're lucky to have a job. Another driver who reached out recently had a story of a colleague whose hands had become so swollen. And many of these drivers have different symptoms. We don't know what is causing it because there hasn't been an appropriate health analysis. But um, they have rashes. This is a common, like, rashes that jump around the body. Mm -hmm. Different swellings. The hands will often get swollen. Joint pains, numbness, um, none of these things have been examined in a formal way, but the drivers have the symptoms, and this driver complained to his boss about his hands being so swollen that he couldn't even drive his truck, and he was fired that day. Um, so they are being really, they're taking the brunt of this regulatory back hole. And I'll just, so, you know, how is this possible? Um, and it is because of regulation. So jumping back now, um, to a really important exemption. And, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, we hear talk a lot um, of, um, you know, pulling back regulation, the importance of letting, you know, keep the economy up, mm -hmm. cut the red tape. Um, I mean, that is what happens. Though a driver crawling around in a tank, mm -hmm. you know, smiling because mm -hmm. they think they're not, they're only dealing with salt water and nothing dangerous and mud. Um, that's, you know, the sharp end of this idea of cutting back regulations. Mm -hmm. Here is a really important regulation that a lot of people don't even know exists. So I'll focus on this for a moment. Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. In the late 1970s, we had a really good idea as a country. Um, we're gonna, we know we produce hazardous waste. We have industry, and some of this industry produces waste that's hazardous. But let's, let's at least appropriately designate it as hazardous, label it as hazardous which means workers handling it will have to be trained to handle hazardous waste. It will have to go into appropriate trucks designed for carrying hazardous waste. It will have to end up in a landfill appropriately designed to hold hazardous waste. Um, so cradle to grave designation of hazardous waste. All of the waste brought up at a wellhead that I pictured in that first slide, the brine, various sludges and drill cuttings as well, scales, things that can have even higher concentrations of radioactivity than brine, they received this stunning exemption. Um, and we have, uh, the quotes are from a 1988 EPA assessment of the exemption, which is a, a, just a shocking, or maybe striking is a better word, a striking window into EPA's own um, thoughts on you know, how this exemption um, can be justified. And the reason they justified it is because they literally said there's so much oil and gas waste produced. We know it's high. This, we, and they even mentioned in this paper that there's radioactivity. There's toxic heavy metals, there's volatile organics. Um, but if we had to regulate all the waste as hazardous, and we know it's hazardous, we have to actually label it hazardous, it would cause a severe economic impact on the industry. So this, I mean, this is the kernel of everything. You could not have a truck fit, you know, filled with the levels that we just laid out uh, with no hazmat placard if it were not for this exemption. The EPA also went on in that analysis to say it literally would be a permitting burden. There's so much waste produced, we wouldn't be able to handle it. 
Um, and we wouldn't have enough regulators to deal with it. And this is exactly, if you spend time in areas of oil and gas production, I mean, this is what we're seeing right now. The regulatory agencies are completely overwhelmed. The EPA essentially predicted that. Um, and I just want to, not to make it political, but to show that this stretches across all politics. Um, it was two Democrats who came up with this exemption. Benson was a Texas senator, um, mm -hmm. and Bevel was an Alabama congressman. Benson was the Secretary of the Treasury under Bill Clinton, and no administration has laid a hand on this exemption. So it's skated right through the Bush years, the Obama years, and, and clearly on into the present. Um, really significant exemption. And this, uh, in the story, I you know, interviewed a number of people, what would happen if we closed the exemption um, and varying degrees of disaster. You, would, you put, the biz, put the industry out of business, yeah. um, complete disaster, yeah. says this so legal scholar at the University of Cincinnati, Jim O'Reilly. Um, you know, the main issue is cost. And, 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 I, and I, it's great to speak in academic settings because I think this is an area where more research, people need to examine this exemption and write reports that are looking at it in many different mm -hmm. lights and determining what would be the cost. But this one radiation expert, he just looked at the cost of taking waste. Um, so you have a lot of solid waste as well being produced that's gonna have a high radioactive signature. And, that, and it's a type of waste called drill cuttings. And it um, comes from literally, if you drill a hole for oil and gas, what comes up is some sort of soil and rock material. The industry refers to that as drill cuttings. If you go back to that, it, um, the image of the Marcellus, we have, um, you're drilling vertically to get oil and gas, and a conventional well is just oil and gas that has escaped the mother load. Again, the black shale is the mother load. That's where the oil and gas is locked up. Over time, it can seep out, and it will collect in a pocket in the earth that the industry refers to as a trap. And if you drill into that oil and gas, it's, it's there at pressure, so it often will, you know, fountain up or come up in an easier way. It comes up fairly easily. That's conventional. We've been harvesting that for some time. Fracking is different because we're going to the mother load, we're going into the black shale, and we literally have to crack it out of the rock. It's not, it doesn't come up so easily just by putting the well down. But we drill vertically down, and then we drill horizontally. But remember back to the USGS paper, black shales are radioactive. So we are drilling horizontally through a known radioactive layer that the USGS you know, examined for its uranium content in 1960, and everything that is in that drill hole space comes back up. Those are drill cuttings, and those are radioactive drill cuttings. And we're now bringing up the uranium and thorium itself, where we're taking up the bottom of the chain, um, as well as the radium and everything else. And so those drill cuttings um, are, right now they're being put in local landfills across Pennsylvania. Again, it's the exemption. It's not hazardous waste. We know it's has uranium and thorium, um, but it's not hazardous. And so this, um, this study was someone who said, what if we didn't have to put, what if we couldn't put the drill cutting and the other solid waste into uh, what's essentially a landfill meant for household garbage? What if we had to take it to a low level radioactive facility? And that alone would jump the cost up by a hundred fold. So this- Because you're not making enough money. Right. Well, no. Well, yeah. And you begin to see, um, and there's a whole other, you know, financial talk to be given. But I mean, of course, the industry is going to fight these regulations. Is going to want to keep the exemption open because what, they're not going to want to jump their costs up by a hundredfold. And that doesn't even include, you know, training the driver to handle hazardous material um, and, and all sorts of other associated costs that would come in. So it's really, um, it, it would completely redefine. The industry. Some people have told me, um, you know what, it actually would be a good thing if you drop the exemption. Some of the better operators could succeed and some of the bad apples would be weeded out. Um, you know, these all would be important questions to look at, and I think a lot more analysis needs to be done there, but we haven't, you know, really even gotten there yet. Um, uh, so, another really important note is, you know, go to the industry's own work on this. Um, and this again cuts to this idea. Initially, I thought, oh, there's this is, you know, so wild, no one's writing on this, but it turns out people have been writing on this and the industry has been writing on this. So this is an article from the Oil and Gas Journal, prominent uh, oil and gas publication, and this is 1990. Radioactive materials could pose problems for the oil and gas industry. Um, and some quotes from that paper. First one gets into issues I know a lot of you are focused on, which is downstream infrastructure. So. Just read that first quote. In varying degrees of severity, norm contamination may exist 
at every oil and gas production site and related facilities, including pipe handling yards, metal reclamation areas, natural gas and NGL pipelines, gasoline plants, and NGL refineries and terminals. So it's the entire spider web of the oil and gas production system. It's not just a wellhead issue. Um, and I think this is, um, I'll get into in a moment, you know, exactly why. How does radioactivity get downstream? But it's so important to know that the industry described this problem themselves. Um, in 1990, here's an even better example, perhaps. This is the American Petroleum Institute. Um, how many people knew the American Petroleum Institute had a Department of Medicine and Biology? Um, I certainly didn't. Um, and the, and I, you know, I'm, of course, in touch with the American Petroleum Institute as I write this paper, um, as I you know, wrote the report and moved forward in the book. Many detailed questions sent to them um, over the space of months. And I got back like a two-line reply that's, you know, we're treating our workers great. It's all OK. Um, but yet, they have a report published almost 40 years ago that lays out in details that it's certainly not all OK. A similar quote from them, almost all materials of interest and use to the petroleum industry contain measurable quantities of radionuclides that reside finally in processing equipment, product streams, or waste. Um, radon 222 and its daughters can cause the most severe impact to public health. And of course, they're concluding um, this could, regulation could impose a severe burden. And I just want to go back to the title page because I think the title of the paper is important. Why did the American Petroleum Institute even take the time to write this report? An analysis of the impact of the regulation of radionuclides as a hazardous air pollutant on the petroleum industry. So there was a time when the EPA was possibly going to regulate radioactivity, um, perhaps use the Clean Air Act to regulate radioactivity, because some of it is airborne, as I'll get to in a moment. Um, that never happened, but in that moment of reflection, the, the American Petroleum Institute thought, wow, this is going to have a huge impact. Let's look at it. So that's why we have the paper. You know, it, our, how will we be affected by these regulations? Clearly, the regulations never happened, um, but that self-reflection gives us a powerful look with the industry's own eyes. Um, so, um, and this is another paper. This really blew me away, the zombie paper. I mean, someone, what's great is giving talks. Someone after a talk said, um, there's a really... Um, you know, interesting shell paper from Shell I have. This is a paper where they looked at environmental cancer in the petroleum industry. I mean, if you say these words right now, you'll be laughed out of the room. And yet Shell wrote a paper connecting cancer, um, you know, and, and, and at, like talking about cancer as an environmental um, issue that certain uh, toxics introduced by industry to the environment could cause. So that was... Um, and these are all things I can pass along to folks. And they talk about radioactivity. The last quote, radioactivity is present in oil and gas and, be and can be traced to cancer of the bone uh, and bone marrow. Um, that um, radium is a bone seeker. Radium has a similar chemical makeup as calcium. So the body will um, take radium into the bone structure. Now, some of it, if you swallow it, may be excreted, but some of it will be taken into the bones. And so you then have radium in your skeletal system. Um, radium, like any radioactive element, will give off, you know, it does what radioactive elements do, which is give off a blast of radiation. Um, and after, and it really likes shooting off a piece of itself. So it's, it's an unstable element, it shoots off a small piece, that is radiation, you don't want to be near that. And after that, it literally has become another element. Um, if you have radium in your bones, this is going to be happening inside your body. Um, and there's some really powerful known cases of, um, of what happens, you know, the, the radium girls being one. Um, I'll get into that in a moment, but I want to focus on the decay chain process. So you have radium, radium is at the wellhead, and when radium blasts off radiation and goes through its decay, you know, it becomes another element, and radium-226, this isotope common in oil and gas waste, um, will decay to radon-222. And so when we look at the downstream contamination referenced in those industry papers, um, they're talking about NGL pipelines. How, how is that happening? That's because you have radon moving through this part of the production cycle. Um, so this is, again, it's a known quantity. You saw it there in the industry papers. I'll show you an EPA paper from 1973 that lays this out. But you have radon in the natural gas stream, in the natural gas liquid stream. So an NGL pipeline, a natural gas pipeline, will have radon. This is known. Radon is a radioactive gas. It will continue 
its decay. And radon actually has a very quick half-life, and it will go through a series of quick decays and eventually decay to lead-210. That's a radioactive isotope of lead. Mm -hmm. And lead-210 will build up in the pipeline system, as well as a further daughter product, polonium-210. Polonium, um, if you follow international thrillers or crimes, so polonium is what was used to murder a former Russian spy in 2006. Um, Alexander Litvinenko put like a little dollop in his tea, I think. Yes. Maybe, uh, polonium is known as one of the most toxic substances on Earth. It is building up, inevitably and invariably, in pipeline systems. And the way it happens, if you think of your kitchen sink, you know, some complicated piece of plumbing or piping, wherever you have a bend or a kink or a change in pressure or a filter is where you're going to accumulate crud. So in the pipeline system, um, the sides of the pipeline can accumulate what's called a film or scale, um, but especially at a place where you have a filter or a valve. So a compressor station really is, um, you know, think about what's happening. Natural gas is a gas, it expands, and you need to keep it compressed to keep it flowing. So a compressor station is a, is, a, is a complicated set of pumps and valves that are running product through continually. These places are exactly where you're going to have the accumulation of radon daughter products like lead 210, polonium 210. Um, so what, what um, Nathan mentioned, this cookbook that I made, is a detailed set of questions for regulators um, who are regulating pipelines, compressor stations, ethane cracker plants will also have this problem on this issue. Um, and they are not even focused on these questions right now. And they matter for a number of reasons. Uh, we can start with the workers. You know, you have crowd accumulating on an integral piece of equipment at a compressor station. So the compressor station cannot operate, the pipeline cannot operate if the essential pump, valve, or filter gets gunked up. Um, with material, and then again, that material is going to have lead 210, polonium 210, it can't operate, so someone's going to have to clean it. If it's an easy cleaning job, it's probably going to be done on site, but I can, those workers, um, at least from the reporting I've done, are not aware of the risk. But often, it's actually done far from the oil field, and so one of the folks I'm in touch with, a story that's going to come out in the book I'm working on, is a worker who works in Colorado, very far mm -hmm. away. Um, from the oil field, uh, far even from the oil field in Colorado, works in a setting um, next to a brewery in a machinist shop. And his job is to clean these complicated valves and filters that have been sent in the US mail from all across the country. Um, and this, again, is it's a really worrisome explosion in terms of who's at risk. Any place where you have accumulation, you have concentration, you have higher levels. So this is a really dangerous job. This person has no clue that they're dealing with a, a gunk that's radioactive, they're doing it in a, in a little spot without windows, with no respirator. Um, they're really sick right now, they left their job, and they're in the act of you know, trying to get this information out. And, um, and again, we don't know what's making them sick, we don't know why they're sick, because um, they haven't been able to get proper health care, um, they haven't been able to get their condition assessed. Um, it's another problem a lot of workers face. But I just bring that example up to show how far afield the issue goes. So I don't think that any regulator, when they let, you know, say, okay, stamp for approval on the compressor station, are thinking about the worker who's going to be utterly unprotected, who's going to clean out the radioactive gunk that's accumulating in the filter. And I just want to show, again, it's so important to show it in the government's own words, in the industry's own words. This is a paper that EPA did, 1973, Assessment of Potential Radiological Health Effects from Radon and Natural Gas. Um, this paper gives a nice scientific description of why you have radon and natural gas, but I just sort of breeze through. Um, and the main research question they were looking at is, is radon going to be coming out of our home stoves at levels that are worrisome? This paper concluded um, that it's not necessarily a problem. This paper was done in 1973. They did not look at any of the gas of any of the oil and gas fields in the Northeast. And of course, 1973 is before fracking, before we got into the Marcellus. Um, and even the own authors give this quote at the bottom where they say what you know, many good scientists do, which is we need more research. They say the fundam fundamental problem in an analysis of potential health effects as derived in this study 
is the necessity of extrapolating from a few measurements or reported values to average conditions. So what they're essentially saying is, we didn't have a big enough data pool, but we're going to give you this conclusion, which is you know, not a concern. Um, and 50 years on, you know, half a century later, we're still using, if you read industry reports who talk about this issue, again, an issue very few people even are aware of that radon <laughs> and natural gas could be a risk. You know, sometimes you'll see them citing back to, well, the UK looked at this. Yes, they looked at this before the fracking boom in 1973 and in a paper that was admittedly um, inadequate. Now, some folks have looked at it since. Carnegie Mellon looked at this issue because this is a major issue. Is radon coming out of home stoves? They determined that it's not necessarily going to be a risk. I think this is an area where researchers now could crack into. Um, New York, actually, right now, the State Assembly is pushing a bill that would measure for radon at what's called the gate, where gas comes from a large transmission line into um, a municipal environment. And it is such a simple, um, such a simple test to do. The New York Assembly tried to pass this bill in 2014. It was shot down with trying again. Um, so here's how we know it's simple. This is upper left, a radioactive gas from crude petroleum. That's the first scientific study um, that the research community who pays attention to this is aware of um, on oil and gas radioactivity, 1904. And it is a beautiful, eloquent experiment. Um, University of Toronto researchers, they went to a farmer's field in southern Ontario. They took a sample of crude oil. They ran it through. There was gases being emitted. Um, they were curious about the gases, ran it through um, some piping and onto a photographic plate. And they determined that impressions were being made on the photographic plate, such that would imply that there's something radioactive. There's a radioactive gas. They did not even know at the time that they were dealing with radon, but they produced this paper, which really is a bombshell paper. Um, yet, you know, I had never heard of it until I dug into this. But why it's also so important is because right now we're in this position where we're relying on this 1973 EPA study to say that we're safe and, and we're saying, oh, well, it's too hard to do this analysis. I mean, that's completely wrong. A high school science class could do, could set up this study right now if they had access to the oil and gas wellheads. Uh, we could take radon samples at the wellhead and get a good idea of how much radon is in the gas stream. We could also take them at the various points along the pipeline system. Part of the problem, even in the Carnegie Mellon studies of fighting fracking in New York, a group of chefs, you know, what if you have a gas, what if you have 10 gas stoves on for like 12 hours a day? Sure, they have ventilation, is that something of concern? Um, but you know, it's you no know, research on it. We can say yes or no, but it hasn't really been looked at. The bottom quotes are just um, conveying, these are industry words, the words of an industry expert who gave a talk that I was led to, really extraordinary talk, um, about how much lead and polonium is accumulating. Um, so again, don't take it from me, take it from this industry expert. Alan MacArthur. Um, NORM, by the way, just uh, an acronym the industry uses to describe naturally occurring radioactive materials. It's meant to put you to sleep and make you think it's all normal. Um, it's, you know, as someone who works with words, it's genius that they call it NORM. Um, but this is a NORM expert. This is someone who's been working on the issue for an industry, and I was recently led to this talk. And so they lay out levels um, and 1,200,000 picocuries per gram. Um, a, a, a comparison is radium, different radioactive element, but a radioactive element, radium has limits at Superfund sites of five picocuries per gram. So even at toxic waste sites, we don't want any, when we're cleaning them up, we want radium levels to remain below five. In natural gas pipelines, here is an industry expert telling us polonium, what was used again to kill Alexander Litvinenko, it's accumulating at levels of 1,200,000 picocuries per gram. That will be cleaned out of the pipeline by someone called a pigger. The work is often referred to as pigging. And this is, again, oil and gas workers. These workers, I've spoken to one of them. Often a crew will come uh, from Oklahoma or Texas. They'll do this work. They are at least told um, that they're dealing with radioactivity, but they are not told in a comprehensive way. And the difference between, I think you, you know, your question is spot on, what is the difference between the nuclear industry and the oil and gas industry? Um, Certainly, there's regulatory issues with the nuclear industry as well, but those workers are often, they are very well informed. And when they look at the levels here and they look at these tasks, like as these piggers would be using a piece of equipment to clean the skunk out of the pipeline and they pull it out, it looks like a complicated drill bit, and they pull it out and it's filled with sludge 
and gunk. And they literally, this is described to me by someone who did the job, they pull it onto a big tarp and they hose it off. And then they roll the tarp up like a burrito with all this sludge dripping everywhere. And they throw it in the back of the truck and drag it to West Texas. Um, and then they take off their Tyvek suit and throw it off too. Now a nuclear industry workers will tell me, you will need you know, years of training to get to the point when you can even be in that setting. And these guys have been given like a 10 minute lesson. This is how you put on the Tyvek. This is how you take it off. That's a very complicated you know, procedure. You're, um, and, and they're not being informed of it in a proper way. And these are some of the questions I have in the cookbook. Like, where is the pigging operation going to be done? There's often pigging stations right before a compressor station. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it looks like, you know, you can see it because it's where the pipeline comes out of ground. It's an access point where they can put in these pigs, these um, drill looking machines. Um, are these questions being looked at? Who's going to do the pigging? Are those workers going to be uh, protected? What sort of vehicle is going to take that waste? And where are they going to take it? Who, I mean, in this regulatory environment, what is there to ensure that they even make it all the way to West Texas? Um, many questions associated with this. Another really important question, um, and this, again, really powerful. This is drawn from a talk given by a UK radiation biologist. I believe he got it from industry. Um, so this is you know, your average oil and gas worker. It does explain the risk uh, in a helpful way. So um, the pipeline isn't necessarily a risk if it's closed off, but it's when a worker goes to access it for some sort of, um, you know, some sort of job, some sort of task where they have to fix something and they open it up, that is the risk. And the diagram explains it pretty well. Um, so you, you have gamma rays coming off the pipeline, but really, the primary risk for a worker over time, um, at least in certain situations, is going to be accidental inhalation and ingestion. <coughs> and I'm just going to, um, I, there's a couple of people here who mentioned they're really interested in, the, in worker issues. So I'll focus on this and then open it up to questions. But this diagram um, is, is wonderful because it actually explains, you know, getting into your body. So we hear often that the skin can block an alpha particle. Gamma can go through your body, and, and if you just listen to that, you have a tendency to be more fearful of gamma rays than of an alpha particle. But alpha particles um, are going to come from a radioactive element that's decaying and shooting off an alpha, and radium-226 is one of those. So radium, when it goes through decay, it will shoot off an alpha. If it's outside of your skin, um, you're okay, but it's very easy for radium to get into your body, and that's because radium can connect to other elements um, it's, uh, it's likely to form bonds and it will often bond to something like a clay, it will often end up in dust. And often these jobs are being done in dusty environments. One of the first, um, I'm just going to cut to this case. So one of the first issues, one of the first alarm bells on this topic was actually run in Louisiana, oil and gas workers who were working in a pipe yard where they were doing a job called pipe cleaning. And that's, they're taking vertical pipes um, the actual piping that runs oil and gas up from the ground up to the surface, it can accumulate a scale, which is this hardened mineral deposit. And that scale, you're, you're running brine, remember also, and brine is radium. So you have a high concentration of radium in that scale. And again, when you're in a setting where you've accumulated something over time, the levels are going to be really high. And so in the late 1980s, there was a situation where these workers in Mississippi had a really specific job in the industry. They were cleaning these pipes, and it was being done in a backyard setting. They, had, they were good machinists, they had good tools, and they knew how to clean the scale out really well. And so some of the big majors, Shell and Chevron, brought them pipes, and um, kind of like a dentist drill, you know, cleaning off tartar, the, the, the job place has been referred to as a rattling yard because you have to rattle the pipes. The scale is stuck on so tight, and that creates a lot of dust as you clean that out. So these workers were accidentally ingesting and accidentally inhaling radium. Um, they became sick. Not only did they become sick, um, one of the workers' wives had a vegetable garden adjacent to an area where they were cleaning the pipes. And the dust from this operation um, covered the soil and also the vegetable. And she actually got sick as well. She was six months pregnant and she sat on the edge of the bathtub and her hip cracked in half. Um, yeah, and so this is how we know that the idea 
of a worker bringing something home to their family. In this case, it was being done in a family environment, but this is a real risk. These risks have been documented. Louisiana is the state where a lot of this um, research has been done. Um, and it's connected to, um, in many cases, um, well, a, a, good, a couple of good lessons here. One is it's connected to one awesome regulator. So a really great source in my story was the former secretary of the Department of Environmental Quality in Louisiana. Um, his name is Paul Temple. Um, and it just shows what one good regulator could do. I mean, this is, he's the head of that state's environmental protection agency. No other regulator in the history of Louisiana or since I don't think has done this. And many states wouldn't do this, but he came in and he sat down all the environmentalists, the quote activists, and he said, tell me what problems there are in this community, in this state. Um, you know, I know there's a lot, tell me everything. And oil and gas radioactivity was brought up. And he said, well, we're going to look at that. He was blown away. He thought he knew everything when it came to the issues. He's a, he has a PhD, a really great scientist. Um, and he actually started examining the issue. One issue, by the way, with the pipes, it's often really hard to remove the scale. Um, and they found out that the industry was often giving these pipes away to, to playgrounds and communities to build fences um, and also to ranchers. A ranch has you know, a lot of fencing. So, like, and this is repeated throughout the story of this industry. You know, They give their waste away as gifts. Um, but this right here is a legal case that came out of Louisiana. And this was really um, just a devastating thing to find in the reporting process. You know, you find out that workers are crawling inside tanks, that the levels may be high, uh, workers collecting samples, which, you know, themselves, because no one else is doing it for them, that's brought out in the Rolling Stone story. And the question is, like, how much risk are they actually facing? Will they get sick? Are these symptoms they're experiencing connected to this, connected to other things? Um, well, I di discovered that there was actually a set of Louisiana legal cases that looked at this in detail. Um, and just to read the first part, lays out the aforementioned plaintiffs worked in pipe yards and onshore and offshore oil production rigs for various companies. During this time, the workers were regularly exposed without their knowledge to naturally occurring radioactive material. Um, so these were workers who were doing really run-of-the-mill jobs, roughneck or roustabout, that's wellhead-related work, um, truck drivers draw, uh, driving sludge, and these pipe cleaners cleaning out the scale. And these workers developed, um, and I'm just going to go to this slide because it's really powerful, various cancers. Um, the list is on the bottom. The abbreviations are up top. Um, and these cancers were linked uh, indisputably to their radioactivity exposure received on the job. And the way that was done was a, a radiation expert um, detailed the exposure in a really granular way and tabulated up. So talk to the workers about what their jobs were. They had some data on what levels were in certain pieces of equipment that they spent most of their time next to. Important to note that these workers worked in the industry for like 10, 15, 20 years. So um, not necessarily like a week in the industry or a month, but they worked for some time. They did the jobs over time. The jobs were well, they were known enough that they could add up their exposure and then put it through this program. If you look in the upper right, that column says IREP. So that's a program called the Interactive Radio Epidemiological Program. And it's actually a program created by the CDC to look at uh, cancer risks in the nuclear industry. And the program uh, takes in these inputs, takes in these numbers, and then it gives you an assigned share, which is a percent determination that the cancer came from radioactivity exposure. Um, and so you can see the numbers are very high, 99.73%, 97.49%. So um, it was determined uh, that these workers' cancers came from the radioactivity exposure. These, the industry settled all of these cases. And I think mm -hmm. that's an important fact. There's a lot of good debate, robust debate, um, about you know, how risky is low level radioactivity? Can it lead to cancers? I've given this talk and had people you know, argue these points. And I say, well, I mean, this is, this is, not only is it created by the CDC, um, they used one of the very few sets of data we have on what radiation can do to humans, which is Hiroshima survivor data. Um, and so, sure, because um, you can't do, you can't simply irradiate people and keep track of if they develop cancer or not. But the times when we have data are from you know, horrible accidents and incidents like that. And uh, that was really you know, just kind of um, 
devastating to learn that that is where this data comes from. And this data is being used to make these models. Um, and, um, and these models, though, are, have been created by our own government. I was in touch with NIOSH, which is the branch of the CDC that has this model. It's the National, National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. Um, they never told me that this program existed. And yet the concern is like, OK, well, we looked in Louisiana. And why did we look in Louisiana? Louisiana, rich oil and gas culture, also a rich legal culture, a lot of trial lawyers. Um, and, and these suits were brought. But this has not happened in other states. And without legal cases being brought, we simply do not know. And if you go back to the early slide, levels in the Marcellus are about eight times higher than in Louisiana. So what is going to come of the workers who are spending regular time in tanks like that, maybe an hour a day, maybe a couple hours a week? Um, no one's looked at it. We just don't know. Um, and I think that is maybe an important point to end it. And I know there's still, um, I have, there's specific, people have specific questions related to compressor stations. That's fine. And I'll leave this slide up because that connects to that. But I'm, I know that's a lot of information. So wow. maybe stop for now and take questions. Yeah. <laughs> If you want me to stop live streaming for people's questions, or if you would like me to continue to do that. Anybody care? I may have a preference. Continue. OK. And not that, thank you. Um, as much as he's talking about the brine, remember all that water? Remember when Sandra Steingraber had her talk? Like that water that they're taking, the fresh water, it's gone forever, right? And it's all being shot into the ground and turning into this brown stuff. So it's horrible. <laughs> anyway, that wasn't a question. Um, no, thank you. And, well, little, just to it's a little bit different. So water being shot into the ground will often come up as something called flowback, which is in the oh. early stages. Okay. No, it's really complicated. But the brine is always down there. So you're always, it's always down there. Yeah, and that's kind of that's sort What's of the, the mind blow. Then? So brine is naturally occurring. And people who defend brine in, in New York in Ohio and Pennsylvania, it's actually, in Pennsylvania until recently, it's legal to put brine, oil field brine, on roads in an effort to melt snow and ice. And so the people who are defending this practice will say it's natural salt water. I mean, you know, arsenic is natural. Um, polonium is natural. All these things are natural. We have this idea, you know, that it's natural, it's not going to harm us. But brine is an extraordinarily uh, toxic chemical signature. But yeah, that's always there. So when you're dealing with fracking, right, you're, you're taking fresh water off and then you're injecting new water and, and you're not losing that water from the water cycle, which is, I think, what you were referring to. Thank you. Which is okay, certainly a problem also. This is very yeah. Well, and it's important because there's so many, um, it's such a complex industry. And I think part of the answer, a, a good question, um, and a question my editors had regularly is like, how has no one covered this? Um, and I think part of the, the answer is that the issue the industry is so complicated, and it takes a long time mm -hmm. of covering the industry until <laughs> you can even understand, you know, like, what is that pipe doing? What is that truck doing? How is it different from the next one? How does this all work? Um, and, mm -hmm. and you could spend this amount of time and go down, you could go down like the fresh water use rabbit hole. You could go down the benzene rabbit hole. You could focus on any number of environmental or toxicity issues. I just focused on radioactivity, but yeah, there's a lot to unpack. Mm -hmm. um, with, with this sort of development. Yeah, question. Yeah. So as I spoke to you before, I'm, yeah. I'm, I come out of the labor movement. I'm just wondering if any of those workers are unionized at all? No. And if so, what's the response been of the yeah. unions? No, great question. Um, no, no union. It's, um, yeah, people often ask, you know, what does, um, you know, what does the union say? And that's a true question. There's no union. So the, um, the, so, yeah. yeah, these drivers, not unionized. Some workers in petrochemical plants, and I know people who are brought on often early on, maybe with a, con uh, a compressor station to construct. They, some of them may be unionized, like engineers. There's a lot of strata. There's a lot of different types of jobs happening. But once you get to the wellhead setting and to the hauling of waste, um, no, not unite, unionized by the Teamsters, no representation. So that's really part of the problem. And you know, the workers are in a bind now, and they're reaching out to me 
because they cannot, they literally get fired if they express concern. Um, I've also heard that if they even, you know, ask a radioactivity question or bring a guy to come to work, they could be let go. They do not have people to take this to. Their local legislators are often not receptive. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they're coming out to a journalist, but they don't even want to stay in this industry, many of them. It's not like they want to unionize and, and do it well. Uh, many of them just want, you know, to do something else. Um, but the industry, this job in particular of hauling brine, of driving these trucks, came about at a time in an area where a lot of people were out of work or doing work that wasn't paying a lot. And I heard a very similar story time and again. People were maybe working in a used car lot or they were trying to make a go of farming and having difficulty. And they saw someone in their community driving a big fancy Ford truck. And they're like, where'd you get that money? And they're like, I've got this great new job. I'm, I'm hauling this water what they're told. I'm home at night, which is rare for a trucker. You're often on the road. And I, there's a lot of overtime. And people flock to the job. They said, where do I sign up? That sounds like a great job. They weren't told um, that there was a risk from radioactive contamination. So, but yeah, it's such an important point, you know, no union. So, um, you know, how do you enter that sphere if you're a labor organizer? Um, and, and I mean, the industry, of course, has fought this uh, aggressively. So they've got a lot of defenses to make sure someone who's concerned, such as yourself, stays out. Um, I think it's a difficult question. I mean, the way I know I can spread light on it is to bring these, the voices of the workers who are willing to whistleblow, bring their voices out um, and shine a light on how they're actually treating these workers, which is, of course, significant because time and again, the industry will use this idea of jobs creation. You know, even in the last democratic debate, you know, why do you want to, go, you know, stop oil and gas, climate change, great topic, um, but I want it to be like the workers, I mean, mm -hmm. they are not, um, they are being sold this deception, um, and a lot of the workers reaching out now, I mean, they, imagine how furious you would be if you were deceived about a job, and not only are you contaminated, but who knows, like, you, you're washing your clothes in your family washing machine for five years, um, these are just unknown questions, and no worker would have taken that risk had they known that, you know, what they were dealing with was, um, was radioactive in many cases. And um, NIOSH is doing nothing. NIOSH has done great work on silica dust. They've done good work on hydrogen sulfide. They've done good work on some really um, important oil field issues. And, but no, on this issue, no, and we're not responsive. And, you know, when I first found this out, I demanded an in-person interview with the head of NIOSH. I was like, we've got to know. And it seemed like for a moment that was going to happen. It never happened. Um, so, but, you know, why has NIOSH done good work on silica? It's because, you know, workers getting sick and people raising their voices. And the industry, of course, fought that. But eventually, you know, there's some protections on that. Same thing with hydrogen sulfide. You know, now workers wear a gas monitor, which is great. That tells them when there's hydrogen sulfide, which can be a gas that can kill instantly. Um, but that, you know, the industry didn't always used to have those protections. But yeah, it's, the, it, I mean, I'm, I wanted to have a detailed conversation with some experts at NIOSH who I thought would have a good knowledge, but I never was allowed to have a one-on-one -on -one talk with them. So I don't, I can't, I don't know how much NIOSH knows, but I know that they haven't acted. Um, on the issue for sure. Yeah. Is there an epidemiological study? Is there anything in the, in the literature? Are, are academics studying this? Is there dosimetry? Anything like right. that? Yeah, focused so, on this yeah, field? All really good questions. Like, especially yeah. with the Marcellus. So, so this is what, I mean, this is what, I, yeah, I think would be so significant. So, is there some studies that, no, I, um, I'll, I'll answer them in, in part. So, is there an epidemiological study? I mean, a study that would look after reading the Louisiana cases, you have a set of cancers that at least in this instance have been linked to work in this industry. So let's look at those cancers, let's look at oil and gas plays around the country, and let's see if there's a correlation. This would be a great place to start. I've never seen that study, but I would love it if uh, a group of researchers decided to take that on. That would be really important. Um, because, um, yeah, I, I mean, the my, um, Assumption would be that this isn't unique to Louisiana. Um, levels are higher elsewhere. Workers have worked for a long time in the industry elsewhere. They've had similar jobs. The mechanisms of the industry is the same. You're going to see cancer clusters. Um, and so, yeah, that's a good place to start. Um, as far as dosimetry, um, 
not required. Some operators have their workers wear dosimeters, and a dosimeter is a way that uh, radioactivity can be measured, and if it's used properly, an employer will say, you know what, you've reached your limit um, for today or this month, and you can't do this particular task, which has a higher exposure anymore. But there's also not all the not all the simulators measure alpha particles, for example. So uh, inhalation, which ends up becoming a really worrisome pathway in a workplace environment, um, it's not going to be checked. Um, but that's you know a place to start as well, I and mean, it's giving you some sort of data. But I think looking at the data that you know the data is hidden and hiding in plain sight. I mean there are ways that you could right away if you took the time to look start to answer some of these questions. Um, so yeah, if you have, I'll definitely my contact info is very easy, and um, you know please stay in touch because if there are people who want to go down that pathway, that's certainly something that I'm very curious to learn more about. Yeah, um, go across like this with the questions. Yeah. Um, so this is a question about pegging. Yeah. So where we are, there is a pegging station right. in, in Braintree, okay, just yeah. across the Fall River. And as I understand it, the gas that comes up the I-9 is wet gas. Yeah, okay. So as you get further away from the wellheads and the Marcella Shale and stuff, um, is the the stuff that's coming out with the pig, yeah. is that still polonium and lead and radon and all that other stuff because... Yeah, yeah, no, great question. So that's, this is, um, this is sort of um, giving a pictorial answer to that question. It's folks in Pennsylvania who are wondering the same thing. So two, uh, so two parts, two different types of waste you're referring to. So the, the radioactive lead and polonium is going to be building up throughout the system and lead has the lead to 10 has a half life of 22.3 years. So again, going back to the industry reports, you have to go through a series of half lives until you've decayed enough of it out for it to be gone. And um, and it's listed as you know for the next hundred years, these systems are going to be contaminated with lead because that you know it's not all decaying at the same time. So you'll still have lead, and then it'll be going into polonium. Eventually, an equilibrium builds up. So um, in terms of the lead and polonium. Yeah, even far away from the wellhead, um, you're going to have levels that are high. Um, but radon is a little bit of a different question. Um, and again, lead and polonium, the risk would be the workers, the workers doing the pegging. So I will find out more about that job as I talk to more piggers. At this point, the workers have the best first-hand knowledge. I can ask regulators these questions, but often they don't even, they're not even aware of these processes and don't have firm answers. Um, so, but from what I know, the job is sloppy, and a great, you know, test again would be, um, and folks have mentioned this in areas where compressor stations have been around for a long time. Um, if you have uh, an area where pigging is done, a pigging station, go over the Geiger counter and check around there, um, or take a soil sample even better and see if you find these things. Because if it's somewhere where pigging has been done year in and year out for say 50 years, um, and it's pretty sloppy from uh, the reporting I've done, you know, you may well find something. If the pipeline is new, um, perhaps not enough pigging operations have been done. But this, again, is all places, you know, we don't know, but certainly, yeah, I would look there. The radon itself, so that's what the EPA study from 1973 looked at. Radon has a pretty quick decay. Um, and I think I also have a slide, yeah, that gets to this. So. Um, for a while, northeastern cities like New York City, Philly, and Boston, we were getting natural gas from the Gulf Coast. It actually takes a pretty long time for the gas <coughs> to come through a pipeline system to the northeast. And the thought was that most of the radon would decay out by the time it got here. Where would it be? It would be as the data products attached to the pieces of the pipeline and components up until then. Um, now getting gas from the Marcellus, um, it's much closer. The radioactivity content is higher. So this, again, is why the New York Assembly wants to look at this. Um, but I think the question you're referring to, does it come out when they flare? This is another great question because, again, if you follow the science, you are appropriately led to this question. The answer is um, we don't know. This is a question I'm trying to ask and get answers on right now. And there's folks in Pennsylvania who called me up to say, hey, they're doing flaring on the pipeline. They've set up temporary flaring stations, and they're actually flaring this pipeline, they're reconverting this, this old pipeline, the Mariner East 2, 
aren't submitted in there since the 1930s. You all probably know about this fight. Um, and, but they've been flaring it. They're worried what's in the emissions. Um, and so they had this question. And I was able to connect them with uh, Marco, this nuclear forensic expert, who said, yeah, this is, you know, gave appropriate um, instructions on how to take such a sample and said, this is a great chance to take a sample. So, you know, the next time a flaring event is done and someone's there, you don't have to go into the flare. Radon is a heavy gas. Um, if, if there's a little dip or valley near, near the flaring site, you know, one would expect that maybe that's somewhere where radon could be accumulating or radon daughter products like lead 210 would be falling out. So take an air sample um, would be the best way. And that's something we're looking into now. So I've been able to link up a community member to the scientist. And, and we're trying to answer that very thing. And it's a significant question. And if the regulators tell you, oh, don't worry about that, say, OK, well, where um, can you show me the testing you've done to determine that we shouldn't worry about it? And then you can show the industry papers that show indisputably that you have these things in the pipeline system. So they can say, don't worry, but I have not seen any data that they've done to you know, check across the board the flares for radon. Um, so I you know, will be convinced until I do see that. Um, maybe it exists, but please you know, send it my way if you find it. But it's, these are the sort of valid questions where because this has remained below the radar, um, it hasn't been assessed in the way that it should have been. And yeah, what a disaster, because now we're popping compressor stations up all over the place and sending flare stacks out, and appropriately worried about all else in the flare stacks. But here is yet another thing I think that's you know, a valid concern. Um, and there's a question over here on this side. Well, um, is there anybody else from Wayne yeah, who really has? Okay, well, my question was Has any study like this been done in another country where there's also fracked gas or um, uh, gas pipelines? And you know, that's a, that's a really great question. The US, we actually have some great researchers, and I would say um, from the work I've done, we're ahead of the curve. Um, Industry may have some really good scientists on this in other countries, especially some of the big majors, but I don't have their data. But as far as other countries, I mean, it's done sloppily here from the little mm -hmm. information I have, which again comes from workers who have worked in oil fields across the world. They tell me that it's done in an even more sloppy manner in other places. Mm -hmm. um, and I know because the scientific literature is you know, global, some of the best work does come out of the US. There's um, a professor at Duke, Avner Vengosh, who has done fantastic work on this. He is a geochemist. Uh, a lot of his students have went on to do good work. So he has a PhD student, former PhD student, who now has his own lab at Penn State. Uh, his name is Matt Warner. And there's a group at Penn State that's looking into this. Um, there's John Stoltz, who um, uh, originally went to um, BU, now at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh. Um, there's Marco um, Kaltepin, who's at Worcester Polytechnic. There are uh, a good, there's a good group of researchers, um, um, a professor uh, at Yale as well who's looking at health issues, um, Nicole Vezier. Um, so people are starting to look into it. And what's exciting is that they become really interesting scientists at their academic institutions and, and graduate students are, you know, mm -hmm. like flocking to them. So there is, you know, there's growing awareness. Something that's really important though, um, is that you know it's hard to get funding because right now climate change is appropriately getting quite a lot of funding everyone knows about that problem no one knows about this and the funders don't know about this so even scientists um, have conveyed to me that it's difficult to get funding to maybe do a project like measuring by you know a compressor station because it's hard to get a funder's ear. another reason why i'm giving talks you know, and a funder was at a talk i just gave in dc which was great yeah. and they're like we want you to come talk to a a conference of funders. I said, that would be perfect. Yes. So, um, oh, yeah. But, um, yeah. So this story seems kind of parallel with like the Exxon New story. Yeah. And it's interesting that, as I recall, that story broke with a, a work that was done by the Columbia Journalism School in conjunction with journalists at, in the LA Times, I believe where they yeah. broke the story about Exxon's own research on climate change right. and knowing it. And when you showed the, the papers from Shell back in 1960, it, it right. just seems like a parallel story, but, but it's like at the inception. Yeah. And, and uh, so although you mentioned all of those scientists, it seems like there's other academic researchers who 
like in the Exxon New it, it, uh, case, it got picked up by people like Naomi Oreskes at Harvard, who's yeah. a historian of science. And she's a scientist as well, right. but she took it more in terms of the political, um, re the research on the politics and the history and, and ex yeah. exposed it in the academic literature that way. So it seems like this is on the cusp of going in that direction as well. Roy, it's a great point. I, I mean, right, the 1982 American Petroleum Institute report, like if you're deep in the weeds like I am, you find that you're like, oh my goodness, they knew. Um, but for most people, the issue is so fresh that they want to have the context to understand how important that is. I think over time, um, yeah, you know, a paper like that, it will be just, you know, recognized how relevant. And, and absolutely, you're right. The more researchers cracking into this from different angles, journalists in other countries, I'm in touch with the folks in the UK as well, you know, that is really important just to get the public dialogue up to speed so we can, you know, understand this and then move forward accordingly. Um, yeah. Do you have uh, some kind of information sheet or fact sheet we could give to the workers there, the ones that are constructing it, but also ones that work at the plant, something we could give to them and notify them of all these dangers? Yeah, right. No, it's a good question. And so, um, but I would, um, or just to, to, to be clear, right, so the workers who are building the compressor station, I know there's past toxicity issues associated with the compressor station. They're not necessarily going to be at risk from some of these things because they're putting the equipment together. So I wouldn't want you to, like, raise an alarm bell on that when that's not the problem. Uh, and the problem, it's actually, you know, the workers who do the picking work, um, can, it can be a little bit mysterious. They're not often going to be local workers. What I've learned is that there's a couple um, very special permitted injection well sites in West Texas, and there's one company in particular called Modus, which has this permit. Uh, when an industry or a company gets one of these, you know, special deep well permits, it's like a pass to just um, sort of, you know, I don't want to say put anything down, but it's a very coveted thing. And so suddenly, I mean, it's appropriate. They have a salt cavern. They can put low-level radioactive waste there. But so then they become, you know, well, let's go out and find it. And pigging produces it. So often, um, at least with the workers I've spoken to, you know, they're taking it back to a site in Texas. The workers might be from Texas. This gentleman told me they came up to Pennsylvania for like six months, traveled around, did pigging at various sites. Um, so I, I think it's appropriate to take to the workers, but I think with the compressor station, I don't you know, know enough about who the exact group of workers would be. It might not be the people outside building it, but once it's up and running, certainly if there's a local, and this could be a union job, maybe there's a union that has some sort of pipe fitter who's coming to check the piping, that, that is gonna be a risk. And that's certainly someone I think you know, would be deserving of information. So that could be, uh, we'll just go back to that diagram. I mean, that could be an appropriate person. Like if a compressor station two years in has a problem with a piping and someone has to come and open up a valve, is that person going to know? Probably not. So um, I think there are appropriate channels, but I just want to make sure that it's not uh, blanketed in front of you know, everyone. But yeah, really good question. Any last burning questions? We're closing in on 5 o'clock. So. But we, no one's going to kick us out. It looks like it, one more. Um, yeah, so I'm also a journalist. Um, I was wondering, like, what further reporting do you think can happen to, like, get this out more, the story? Can you or, you, or, I mean, I'm happily encouraging other journalists yeah, or, to enter this field. Yeah. So there's just so many pathways. I mean, one pathway, you know, that I'll be looking at in the book is the people who clean this equipment sent from these facilities. A big thing right now in Pennsylvania, I'm writing for a really great journalism nonprofit called Public Herald, and they're based in Pittsburgh, and you can look at Pennsylvania-centric issues, and one issue is the issue of all this waste building up with landfills. The landfills produce leachate. How much radioactivity is in that leachate? The leachate is processed by a sewage treatment plant, which can't remove the radioactivity, and discharges into a local waterway where kids are fishing. So there's just, like, once you get into it, um, all sorts of contamination pathways open up. And I would say, you know, focus local, focus small, um, and focus on something, you know, if you're based here, it might be hard to get to the Marcellus, um, but certainly, you know, focus in a local way. Um, there's a company I know, I've been writing about this for Desmond, but there's a company called XNG that's actually based 
um, in northeastern Massachusetts, Andover. Yeah, in Andover. And what they do is they run, so a lot of people have been fighting pipelines. Pipelines are beat. They've set up a virtual pipeline system. This is a really tricky, um, worrisome thing that is wrapped in scanty regulations, but they're taking natural gas from one pipeline and literally bringing it, in some cases, along the route of the where the pipeline was defeated and injecting it back into other pipelines, or they're used to take to like a rural hospital or a rural university. I've written a couple articles about that for um, Desmog, but, um, but that's like, I think, you know, there are companies, there's a waste company that's based in Connecticut. Connecticut's outlawed fracking waste, but they've got a company that has these landfills in Ohio. So I would just try and hunt around and see, you know, where, if it's, even if it's not waste in your community, there may well be a company operating from your region that's dealing with this, and that could be a way to crack in as a journalist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I'll have the cookbook side <laughs> if you all want a cookbook. Um, it's, it's really designed, it's a set of questions, explains the topic, and then, um, like just today, there was a FERC comment period for the mm -hmm. Iroquois, a, a compressor station on the Iroquois pipeline. So these are ways that we all, you all can, you know, say, um, hey, regulator, have you considered these emissions? Have you tested this? Um, I, where's your answer? I want this before I know that you know this project is safe to go forward. Um, and hopefully, you know, um, I mean, yeah, FERC is interesting. I think uh, it, it's, well, as difficult as they are, you know, FERC will actually get back to me with answers, which is better than most regulatory agencies. So, um, but I, I'm aware of you know how problematic they are for communities and how much power they have. But I've seen like a small degree there of that, like they are digesting. And so I, I again, important to mention, you know, all these bites and all the science that you all bring to them um, in a way for a regulator that's, you know, um, it has an effect. And I, and I can see that with that agency, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know when the real change is coming that I know a lot of, a lot of us want out of this agency. But I know that it's, um, you know, in some level, I mean, and you have to remember, like, these people, um, I mean, many of them have young people in their lives or children and are, like, on some level aware of, you know, what um, enabling this type of development, you know, means. And, and especially, again, this, um, you know, when you, talk, when you talk about their own workers uh, in the industry, I think that helps really change the dialogue. So um, I'll be here to answer other questions or... Um, give you a cookbook. Thank you so much. Okay, so get a cookbook if you'd like. I hear the voice of my great granddaughter saying, Shut down and break down. Says the people of the earth gonna rise up. We're gonna calm this crisis down. I hear the voice of my great granddaughter saying, Shut down and break down.